So what are the types and causes of, um, of high bilirubins in newborn babies? Well, there's a number of ways that bilirubin is, um, is classified. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about these in some detail in, in the next few slides. Because my perception in previous years is that this has been a confusing area uh, for staff to understand. So it's ca classified into conjugated versus unconjugated. Um, so, of course, the conjugated form is the form that's first created by the breakdown of the red blood cells, and then it's conjugated in the liver. It uh, has a glucose molecule attached to us, and this turns the bilirubin from a fat-loving to a fat-hating form, um, which is thus easily excreted. Um, so that's the form there that gets into the brain and causes the damage. It's fat-loving, um, and that's the, f the, measure, the level that we're actually measuring with our bilirubin tests. Uh, physiological versus pathological, by definition, any, any jaundice that's clinically apparent in the first 24 hours is pathological. Uh, any jaundice which can still be present and to pathological levels but is not present until after uh, 24 hours can either be physiological or pathological. Do you understand what I mean by that? Okay, good, okay. Uh, hemolytic versus non-hemolytic. Um, so the blood cells getting burst apart or the bilirubin level going to very high levels for other reasons uh, and late versus early. All right, so let's, the, probably the most common cause of hemolysis um, and high bilirubin levels that we would see in our practice is from uh, hemolytic disease of the newborn. Um, so the classic hemolytic disease of the newborn was rhesus, big D. Um, but I don't know if you're aware, but there were actually six rhesus groups. Um, big D, little d, big C, little c, big E, little e. All right, so that, they're all rhesus groups, but the classic rhesus disease is the big D. And that's, of course, when you have somebody rhesus negative, they haven't got the big D. And so you rush in if they have a rhesus positive baby who does have the big D, and you give them anti-D, anti-big D. All right. So that's, that's the classic um, hemolytic disease of the newborn, which, of course, has not gone away. Uh, it's still present, and it's still dreadful. It's extremely aggressive. Anti-D is not to be sneezed at. If you, you guys do a great job when you get that anti-D into those mothers, um, assuming they haven't been sensitised. It's very, very aggressive disease still. And still, um, I mean, in utero transfusions is a big deal for mother and baby. Uh, what did you mean by assuming they haven't been sensitised? Uh, you know how the mother can be, have been, if she's had, say, a miscarriage or something like that, she have, can have been sensitised already. Oh, okay. that's, what, that's what I'm getting at, yeah, yeah. Um, and look, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of the Tauranga case where the um, uh, baby had in utero transfusions, exchange transfusions post utero, um, and then was sent to an outside centre, which I've said now is Tauranga, and um, another haemoglobin wasn't done once it went home, and it presented in shock with, a with about one haemoglobin molecule left um, and died. Uh, so once these go home, don't take your eye off the ball. Uh, the hemolysis continues. You need to watch those hemoglobin. Um, in the NTD, you need to watch those hemoglobins like a hawk um, because it can still keep dropping up to three months and more. Even though they've been exchanged transfusions and even though they've had um, good hemoglobin levels once they've been discharged, that hemolysis can, can continue and they can get into strife. So that baby presented in, well, basically in heart failure. Um, and what, what would you think the first thing the mother noticed with that baby? What's the first symptom she noticed? This is a great symptom in terms of a flag that the baby's starting to run into trouble. What do you think the first thing the mother noticed? It was feeding. The baby was taking longer and longer to feed. That's, that was it. It was so breathless it wouldn't feed. That's a great flag uh, for problems that are just appearing. Um, if you've got an ABO set up, and I'll talk about what that is in a second, and you've got rhesus disease, there's a little bit of protection for the rhesus disease, but that's for reasons that nobody quite understands. All right, so um, ABO disease. Now, now that rhesus has been pretty much, well, pretty much treated, um, ABO disease is probably the, uh, the, the most common cause of hemolytic jaundice uh, that we now see uh, in, our, in our practice, certainly in counties Manukau. Um, and of course, it's the mothers that are group O, which is the commonest blood group, mothers that are group O, all group O mothers have naturally occurring anti-A and anti-B antibodies, naturally occurring. So if they have an A or a B baby, or an AB baby, then antibodies will have crossed to the mother and caused hemolysis of the baby if she's group O. And those naturally occurring antibodies are an IgG, which crosses the placenta. Um, luckily, if the mother's group A and she has a group B baby, 
uh, or the other way around. The naturally occurring antibodies still occur in those women, but it's an IgM, and it's less likely to cross the placenta. They can still be an IgG, but it's an IgM. So those, those mothers are probably going to be okay. But if you have a group O mother, um, and the baby's starting to go yellow early, odds on you've got a, in a hemolytic setup being created there, and it can be just, just as aggressive as rhesus disease, and so it needs to be uh, considered. Look, if the baby is jaundiced for other reasons, and I've, I've touched on these, the enzyme deficiencies which cause um, the red blood cells to not last as long, um, red cell abnormalities in themselves, spherocytosis, elliptocytosis, again, these conditions create the red cells, make the red cells not last as long. The bigger breakdown, higher bilirubin turnover, and the baby can't manage the increased jaundice load, or the liver can't and the bilirubin goes sky high. Just want to um, talk in a little bit more detail uh, about, um, uh, about the antigenicity created by these conditions. Um, in a term newborn, the rhesus antigens are very, very well developed, which is why it's such an aggressive disease. ABO antigens are not quite as well developed, but are certainly there present. And I'll talk about, about why that's important uh, when we talk about the, um, uh, the, um, the Coombs test in, in uh, the next slide. Um, the other blood groups can cause problems, but are, are a lot less. And I don't know if you realise, but Kel, Duffy, Kid, they've changed their, their names. Kel's still K, but Duffy's now FY. I don't know if you get these funny antibody results back on your mothers that probably freak you out, okay? So um, JK is the old kid, Lewis, M and S. These are terribly well anti developed antigens on the neonatal red blood cell. So even though the mother may have the antigens, it's not necessarily gonna cause any problems. So when you get these results back, you can kind of relax but not take, so the mother's got these antibodies, you can kind of relax but not take your eye off the ball. The most um, significant of these antibodies are usually the ones to kid, uh, anti Big E, which of course is one of the rhesus group, but not the classic rhesus, uh, and anti little c, which is the same. Um, the other uh, an antigens that you might have in your uh, hemoglobin reports, or sorry, antibody reports, are usually IgMs, which is the big molecule there. That's the IgG, which is the small molecule there, and shouldn't cause you any problems. Um, I just want to quickly talk about the Coombs test, the direct Coombs test I'm going to talk about. So what this does is there's, there's your... Um, uh, baby's red blood cells, and it's got, it's, the, it's got the mother's antibody attached to them. So you put them into a serum with some other antibodies that attach to antibodies and make all the red blood cells group together, and that shines up on an, an ELISA, so that's the direct Coombs test. Just realise that you need to have enough of those antibodies attached to antigen sites for that to become positive. So if you've got an ABO situation, you've got a mother who's O and the baby that's A or B, it may not, because the antigen sites aren't quite as well developed, there may be not enough antibodies attached to antigen sites to make the Coombs test positive. But there's still hemolysis happening and there's still a problem evolving. So the Coombs test <coughs> may be negative, but there's still a problem. Do, do you understand? So just if the mother's A, O, and the baby's A or B, and the baby's jaundice, it can still be a rampant hemolysis happening, even though the Coombs test is negative. So don't just because the tumor test is negative doesn't mean that there's significant uh, hemolysis taking place. Um, why is jaundice becoming, um, I think, a, a bigger issue for us? Um, again, it's the same issues as for feeding, early discharge, feeding problems, and weight loss. Uh, as the baby gets drier and drier, um, uh, the um, uh, bilirubin will go higher and higher. Breast milk jaundice is a real phenomenon. Um, and I'll talk about that again uh, coming up. Uh, these are the graphs that jaundice is plotted on. Um, the x-axis there with time from birth, the y-axis there with um, bilirubin levels. This is for physiological jaundice of the healthy term newborn. You'll notice there's no lines in the first 24 hours because if jaundice has occurred in the first 24 hours, it's not yeah. physiological, it's pathological. Um, babies become clinically jaundiced when the level gets to about 250. Uh, and they, and the jaundice starts at the head and goes south. Have you noticed that? The head's jaundiced and the, I've never understood why that is, but it's a true phenomenon. So if the baby's jaundiced from head to toe, it's probably about 250 at least. Um, if the legs are lighter and the head's not uh, dark, you, you probably can wait and watch that one, but as, if it's he heading south and looking yellower and yellower, 
uh, then start to get worried. So that's the, um, and so there's our lines there, ab above that line there, consider exchange for infusion. Uh, in that gap there, consider phototherapy, and below there, you're probably, you're probably fine. And of course, this is from Counties Manukau, and I'm not, these graphs will be very similar uh, in your own units um, uh, in um, uh, whatever DHB you come from. Uh, and so this is, the this is the graph for pathological jaundice, and you'll see that there's now levels from um, the first 24 hours, and of course these lines are set a bit lower than they were on that previous graph, and there's also some birth weight phenomenon or information built into this. Um, so if a baby falls into one of these ranges there, the treatment is as we've, uh, as we've discussed. Um, so the, my rule of thumb is that if you have a cord bilirubin, and if you suspect there's going to be a hemolytic setup, if you have a cord bilirubin uh, above 50 or 60, then that probably needs to be watched. Uh, that's not a normal cord bilirubin level, and that baby may start to be developing a, he a hemolytic setup. What are the treatments? Oh, um, in terms of um, uh, other forms uh, of jaundice, um, there is the late jaundice, and this is um, uh, something I'll talk about uh, more in the uh, slides just coming up. Um, so, late jaundice, it can also be um, uh, unconjugated. Uh, jaundice, so not combined with the glucose molecule. It can be due to um, the breast milk jaundice, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, look, the other thing for both late jaundice that's unconjugated and conjugated jaundice is hypothyroidism. Uh, if you've got persisting um, uh, if you've got persisting jaundice and the baby is especially lethargic, and of course that because the jaundice is quite high, don't take your eye off the ball with that. Hypothyroidism is um, something that needs to be considered. Um, of course, the Guthrie card does check for hypothyroidism, the Guthrie card you take off on day three. Um, what's the Guthrie card looking for if, to, to, to diagnose hypothyroidism? Do you know what it's actually trying to detect? Thyroid stimulating hormone. Big pardon? Thyroid stimulating. Yeah, TSH. It's trying to protect the next stage, so the thyroid gland's not working, so the thyroid stimulating hormone is going crazy. But of course, that's only for primary hypothyroidism. If you've got the hypothalamus or the... Um, uh, or the pituitary itself not working properly, um, then the TSH is going to be low. All right, so that will need a formal thyroid, thyroid level uh, detected uh, in, a, in, a, in a TSH in addition to that. So, of course, hypothyroidism is the most common, um, uh, sorry, primary hypothyroidism is the most common form, form of hypothyroidism, and of course the most common disease that you're going to pick up on the Guthrie card, uh, much more common than PKU and all those other and all those other forms. So don't forget about hypothyroidism in, in terms of um, uh, un late jaundice, let's say persisting beyond two weeks uh, in um, uh, unconjugated and unconjugated uh, bilirubinemia. Now I'll talk about um, uh, conjugated hyperbilirubinemia uh, just coming up. All right, so what treatments do we use? Um, rehydrate the baby. Phototherapy is by far the mainstay of our treatment of, of even very high jaundice levels now. It's interesting that phototherapy, that was discovered as a treatment serendipitously in, in Sweden they noticed the um, babies in the sunny part of the ward didn't get as much jaundice as the babies in the, um, uh, in the dark part of the ward. That's how phototherapy was in, invented. Um, it converts the bilirubin molecule from the fat loving to a fat hating form. That's basically what it does and it's weed and pooed out. Um, uh, and, of course, the extreme treatment, which is about the only thing we used to do in neonatology, is exchange transfusion. Um, but the treatment, this treatment itself has a known mortality. It's a 100, 1 200 mortality with the exchange transfusion itself. So it's something we avoid like the play. Uh, and, of course, if there may be some underlying condition that's contributing to the jaundice, uh, such as sepsis. <coughs> Um, some, some rules of thumb of sort of jaundice levels at various time points that might flag as um, that, that you're, you might have a problem. Um, and I, I just give these to you as a guide. And I've, I've already mentioned the, um, uh, the, um, the cord blood level at which to flag it. Um, on the, uh, for baby, this is probably the problem that you see quite a lot, persisting jaundice going on for a long, long time. Um, and I, I had on my previous slides, I had that as the levels less than 200. But look, I think we see in South Auckland levels that grumble on between 200 and 300 for quite a long time. And, and that's, I'm going to put it to you, it, it can be normal, um, assuming that the feeding intake is correct. And, um, and breast milk jaundice is a true phenomenon. 
uh, really is. There seems to be some inhibitor of the um, uh, of the conjugation process uh, that's in uh, in breast milk um, for reasons that we don't know. Um, so the mechanism is unknown, and the only way to diagnose it is to stop breastfeeding um, and formula feed, which of course we're not advocating for one minute. Um, that's the only way you can diagnose breast milk jaundice. Um, is breast milk jaundice benign? Well, look, I'm afraid there have been cases of connectoris documented with breast milk jaundice. Um, so I, can we say it's benign? Uh, I think it, it can get to levels that can cause a problem. Um, however, um, persisting bilirubin levels in that sort of 200 range can grumble on for many, many weeks after delivery and then just gradually, gradually go away for reasons that people don't quite understand, um, which is a true phenomenon. Okay. <coughs> now, jaundice longer than two weeks, and uh, in particular, I'm going to focus on uh, conjugated bilirubin. So this is the molecule that's been. This is the bilirubin molecule has been uh, attached to a um, uh, to a uh, glucose molecule, but the level is persisting uh, in the serum. Um, uh, no normal ranges are there. It, uh, it, it, it's usually less than 10% of the total bilirubin level or a level less than 20, but greater than 30 uh, requires some extra thought. And look, I, I've heard a rumour that uh, this is another thing that the College of Midwives is advocating you guys screen for. Is this news to you? or um, All right, okay, maybe news to you. I'll Screening for biliary atresia. Um, all right, okay, well, let me move on. Biliary atresia is the condition that we fear with this... Um, with this persistence of, um, uh, of conjugated bilirubinemia, hyperbilirubinemia. Look, it's actually very rare, um, but not as rare as some of the things we're looking for on the Guthrie card. Um, and it seems to, for some reason, the world, the highest incidence is in French Polynesia. Um, seems to be two subgroups, those uh, associated with syndromes and those that are not, and uh, it's the non-syndromic ones that, are, um, that uh, are more common, and they tend to present later in gestation, preterm babies don't tend to have this, and it just gets worse uh, and worse with time. And unfortunately, only a, a very small proportion of these uh, bilirubin, uh, sorry, biliary atresia conditions uh, are correctable by, um, uh, by surgery. Um, etiology is unknown, and um, uh, it's, um, uh, it's a great mystery. Um, but one thing I can emphasise is the timing of surgery is very important. I'm going to talk about that shortly. What are the signs of this? Um, the babies are not yellow, they're green. Um, has anybody seen babies with this condition? It's, it's quite common in preterm babies that get infected with the commonest congenital infection. What's the commonest congenital infection? CMV. CMV, yeah. yeah. CMV causes a florid hepatitis, which actually can create a conjugated hyperbilirubinemia, not because of... Um, uh, biliary atresia, but because the liver just the biliary flow just shuts down uh, and they go very very green. But so, so they're very green, astonishingly green. Um, usually, somebody got a jersey about the same colour. No, no, nobody has today. Um, and of course, their their bowel motions go white, and I'll show you that on the next slide uh, or a slide coming up. And their urine goes very very green because it's now fat, uh, water loving and is excreted in the urine. They start <coughs> peeing Coca Cola. That's what it looks like. Um, so the differentials, the most likely diagnosis, I mean, CMV, uh, the baby would be otherwise very unwell if it had CMV, but the mo other than biliary atresia, the other um, differentials are hepatitis for, for various other reasons, which I won't go into, uh, and um, other sort of in internal liver uh, divermental problems, which again, I won't go into in any detail. Um, this is a stool chart produced by, um, it was t published in a very prestigious journal, um, uh, produced by a, a, um, uh, a, a Korean group, but it has been shown to have quite good validity. This is stool colour, and of course this doesn't come through on your black and white handouts. Um, this is a, a means of uh, screening babies for biliary atresia, because this will start to change before the baby starts to look uh, significantly green. So. Baby should that of course the pigmentation in all bowel motions is is bile, okay. So if the bile duct and of course biliary atresia is lack of formation of the bile ducts, or the bile ducts were there and they've become fibrosed, um, the stools will gradually get paler and paler. So this is a screen here for normal stools uh, and a, a screen there for acolic stools, stools without 
uh, any um, pigmentation in them at all. And of course the, the extreme form there is completely white. Has anybody ever seen stools like that? Those of you who have worked in neonatal units uh, probably would have. So that's a flag for uh, biliary atresia evolving. Um, so this might become progressive. They may be fine at birth but get, get gradually get worse over the next few weeks or it might be like this from very early on in the neonatal period. Um, this often doesn't manifest itself at birth. It manifests itself in the first six weeks, uh, which is why we're talking to you, this group, about it. And I thought there was an initiative uh, within the College of Midwives to look at this. Um, oh, there's been stuff coming in the mail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, look, uh, I, I know you're getting inundated with initiatives at the moment, and I'm going to talk about the um, screening for cyanotic heart disease coming up. Um, the reason why... Um, with any screening process, you need to have a decent treatment, and it's 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 quite clear that with biliary atresia, there are sort of palliative surgical procedures. And as I said previously, there's only a very small group of these babies that could actually have cures cure by one operation. But the 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 important thing is that if the surgery is done before 60 days, the survival is much greater. Um, and if you have the surgery done, uh, the reason there's a high range there is at different centres, but if you don't pick this up after 100 days post-delivery, then the outcomes are very, very worse, which is why it lends itself uh, to a screening um, uh, philosophy. Um, despite the fact that you might get the surgery within that period of time, the majority of these babies eventually need a liver transplant because the, uh, there is still biliary stasis and high conjugate levels in the liver basically turns the liver into a, a, a lump of fibrous tissue uh, and makes it no longer functional. Um, but once you, if you get your liver transplant and you're managed well, so if you're in that early group, you're okay for a period of time, then you get your liver transplant, uh, your five-year survival after your liver transplant is very good. So that's, this is a, a, an initiative that lends itself um, to, um, uh, to um, treatment. So look, the most common type of um, biliary atresia is basically where that's the liver there, that's the gallbladder, and that's the bile ducts. Basically all the intrahepatic uh, bile ducts have never formed and the gallbladder is not there. These other forms are variations on a theme, but that's the most common form. So that's biliary atresia, which is a very good thing to, um, to screen for and to treat if you pick it up early. Uh, other surgical conditions, which I'll just touch on. Um, tracheoesophageal fistula. So you're women that have polyhydramnios. Um, uh, one of the differentials for that is tracheoesophageal fistula. Um, the most common form is that there where the, the, the esophagus is a blind pouch at that end is connected to the trachea at that end uh, and the esophagus or the distal esophagus comes off the, the um, distal trachea and goes down to the stomach. The good thing about this condition is because that gap there is, um, is not too great so you can actually cut that off there and cut that off there and join it up again. Uh, it's not quite as simple as that. Unfortunately the next most common condition is, the, uh, of which there's about 10%, there's a huge gap between those two, there's just no tissue there, and that's the form of tracheoesophageal fistula where they have to try and stretch the two bits and bring them together, and sometimes they bring them together and they ping apart again, which can be a bit of a disaster. So that's, um, that's tracheoesophageal fistula. So of course these will present with, um, uh, with um, uh, polyhydramnios because um, there's a blind pouch at that end, so that's on the differential for that. By the way, if you've got a, a baby with polyhydramnios and the lycor looks meconium stained, that might be bile. Always think about that because this proximal bowel obstruction, they'll have bile regurgitation. So that brown fluid, it might, it, that might be bile or old blood. It's not necessarily meconium. So <coughs> when you rupture the membranes, you see meconium there, you say, oh, I don't think that baby was running into trouble. Just think that may not be meconium. That might actually be bile. Um, so look, this is what these babies look like when they're born, uh, and, uh, and of course they, they, they present pretty much straight away. So look, there's the, um, th these are x-rays, there's the, um, uh, they've both got distal, uh, proximal esophageal atresia, there's um, the orogastric tube curled up in the pouch there. Um, so that's type, that's one type, that's one type there. So who can tell me, so there's, that, that's an example of one of these and that's an example of the other one of these. Who can tell me whether number one is A or B? And there's a hint there on the abdominal x-ray. Who can tell me whether that there is A or that's B form of a soft tree? Excellent. Well done. Well done, yeah. 
So look, that's, there's gas there on the bowel, so it has to be that one, all right? Whereas that one, there's no gas there, so it has to be that one. And that, of course, has a much worse outcome than the other. So um, that's the way we can diagnose it, just with the, well, we can diagnose the subtype uh, just with a chest X-ray. So these babies will be born and cannot handle their secretion straight away. So they'll start um, uh, gagging and going blue on you straight away, all right? Um, esophageal atresia. Um, now, look, I'm sure you know that if you see that, that is a medical emergency, all right? Um, okay, so... Vomiting, I think, was, uh, I think, um, uh, no, how, how should I say this? I think wasabi vomiting, uh, we can tolerate that a little bit, the odd light green vomit, but if it's spinach coming out, that's never normal. So newborn babies, you, you know how they vomit quite a bit in the first few hours or days of life. The odd little bit of green stain vomit I think is fine, but if you have that coming out at any stage, that's not fine. That's bowel obstruction of some, some sort. Um, and we're seeing the most common bowel obstructions we're seeing that presenting like this is actually volvulus, uh, malrotation with volvulus. Um, and that, of course, in itself is a medical emergency. There can be um, other forms of proximal bowel obstruction, uh, you know, atresias of the jejunum or anything, I actually anything um, uh, north of the ileocecal valve, atresias at any of those points, you'll have biliary obstruction sorry, bowel obstruction and bilious vomiting. Um, and of course on chest x-ray these babies have a distended abdomen and lots of fluid levels because the um, stuff can't go any further. So look, that's, um, look at this, this is a baby um, that was presented with vomiting and it's got, as you can see, this very distended bowel. Look, that's an umbilical clamp, just ignore that. So um, do you think that baby would have bilious vomiting or non-bilious vomiting? Because vomiting, if it's voluminous and it's not bilious, that doesn't mean there's not a bowel obstruction. So do you think that baby would have bilious vomiting or non-bilious vomiting? Just what do you think? It, it, it would, look, it, it's, um, so that's called the double bubble. Um, and of course, you, in order to have bilious vomiting, you have to have the obstruction beyond the ampulla of vata. So it has to be sort of in the distal jejunum, duodenum at least. So, so this is the double bubble. So this is actually a obstruction that's before the ampulla of vata, which is the point that the bile tract comes in. So this baby will be vomiting like crazy, but will not have any bile in it. So non-bilious vomiting is also uh, uh, a sign. What's that, um, do you know the term for that x-ray picture? It's got a particular term, it's called the double bubble. And what's the syndrome that's associated with the double bubble? And what, but there's a chromosomal syndrome associated with it. It is duodenal atresia. What is it? Which is the chromosome? What's the commonest chromosomal problem you know of? Down syndrome. Yes, Down syndrome. All right, so Down. And of course, this would probably present with polyhydramnios as well. Of course, that atresia may be beyond the ampulla of vata, in which case the amniotic fluid will be sort of dark stained by the bile. All right? Okay. Um, funny umbilical cords. Uh, if you see a big fat umbilical cord like that, don't that, that's take don't take your eye off that. Okay, um, just remember that the umbilical cord it's got our usually two arteries and a vein. But just remember from embryology, the umbilical cord had remnants of it had the the bowel within it, and you can have a vitelline duct remnants, and of course that can be patent, so there can be active bowel within the cord, or it can have the head of the bladder, the uracus which is a remnant in there. There is a baby peeing from its umbilicus, okay? So if you see a big fat cord like that attached to the baby, to clamp it beyond there and take an extra look at that, it might actually be that, a bit of bladder inside it, or it could be bowel. You can have meconium coming out of that. Um, so d don't just don't take your eye off those fat cords. They are they are quite. Um, uh, that's not normal. Of course, it could be just you no know, lots of warts. So, oh, can I interrupt now? Yeah, sure. Right. So if I'm in the middle of nowhere and I see that, I would clamp beyond the umbilical cord yeah. and then clamp it oh, to the Oh, sorry. You, you, you'd, you'd clamp up in this part here, which looks normal, and watch that. Now, look. It could be just a. Uh, it could be a benign cyst. It could be just an excessive amount of Wharton's jelly. But you can see that cord's a pretty sort of small little cord. That's not 
you know, Wharton's jelly, the whole thing, isn't it? That, that's not normal. Um, I'd watch that like a hawk if you're in the back of beyond, and if it's starting to swell, or you, th and the cyst actually could be a big cyst of urine, um, and it's expanding or not going away, I think that would, I don't think you'd be criticised for asking a surgical review of that. So look, don't take your eye off the umbilicus. Um, often, these can be picked up on antenatal scans, but of course, not everybody has antenatal scans. All right, so once that's born, clamp beyond it, yep. Um, first meconium should be within 24 hours, um, certainly within 28 hours. Um, and, <coughs> excuse me, if, um, if uh, meconium uh, hasn't been passed, just always ask the question, is there an anus? Now look, that's meconium coming from a vagina. Um, there's the anus there. So meconium doesn't mean there's an anus, all right? So in your newborn examination, it's, it's it, look, I know, I, can I, I say this, this doesn't happen frequently, but this certainly does happen. Um, that little dimple there, it, it can look very anal-like, but it's actually not an anus. Um, uh, you need to actually see it's patent. Even sometimes those can not can actually have a. It, it actually got a little blind pouch within it, so um, uh, it, it can actually. Um, uh, so meconium presence doesn't mean there's an anus. Um, Meconium plug is a true phenomenon, so the, the delayed passage of meconium may be because um, uh, there's a, a hard plug of meconium inside. It's passed with a white cap and then you know, the floodgates open and everything's fine. Um, of course, if you have um, a, a meconium plug, don't take your eye. That, always think about cystic fibrosis. All right. And of course, that's screened for on the Guthrie card as well. But that's, not a dear, that's not a very good screen, that Guthrie card screen for cystic fibrosis. So just always, always be considered about that. Now, you know I'm, I'm hot on thyroid gland. The longer that, the longer that you are, a baby is rendered hypothyroid, the IQ potential for the future just plummets. It's one of the most important hormones for the, developmental, for the development of the neonatal brain. Uh, well, it is the most important hormone for the de de development of the neonatal brain. Hypothyroid needs to be sprung upon. Hirschsprung's, of course, is uh, the classic one you think about with delayed passage of meconium. Um, and, of course, uh, you can even have delayed passage of meconium and then it's all fine but still have Hirschsprung's disease. Okay. All right, so those are some surgical conditions. Uh, vitamin K. Um, again, um, uh, Shroud waving. Um, this was in counties. Um, this is a, this is a really sad story, and I feel sorry for the midwife concerned. She realised that the vitamin K hadn't been given to the baby uh, at birth, and rang up the parents on day four and said, "I'll come round the next tomorrow morning and give your baby vitamin K." And overnight, uh, the baby bled out into the brain. All right. So this is the thing we fear with with vitamin K. Um, hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. And when that baby uh, presented its prothrombin ratio, which of course is the index of the vitamin K dependent clotting factors, was 5.2 and the upper limit of normal is 1.5. So the baby had definite vitamin K de dependent uh, a coagulopathy. Um, look, so look, again, I'm, I'm probably knowing I'm teaching how to suck eggs, but I, I thought I, I would just revisit vitamin K administration. <coughs> Um, it's okay. The, the, the hemorrhagic disease is, bro is broken down into two, uh, two subgroups. The, um, uh, the, the early, which is of course the more common, um, and, and the late, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, so, look, intramuscular and oral vitamin K virtually eliminates the early onset of, um, uh, of um, uh, the uh, hemorrhagic disease of the newborn in the new early phase. And of course, they bleed in two places, the brain and the bowel, uh, and to a lesser extent, the adrenals. Yeah, bleed in two places. Um, and, um, and the late. And of course, the late is, um, uh, is a lot rarer, um, but still uh, significant. And there are, some, um, uh, there are some factors that are associated with it. Look, th the important thing is that um, the intramuscular dose of vitamin K pretty much eliminates the late onset hemorrhagic disease of the newborn, but the oral dose, assuming you've got it, only reduces it. So by far the oral dose is the most, sorry, the IM dose is the most effective. Um, so parenteral virtually eliminates both forms. Oral is pretty good for the early form, but not 100% for the late form. 
Okay. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you know that that's now discredited. Um, any medicine that the mother takes, the baby's getting it. Any medicine, that's, some, that's with, just, I just assume that, um, whether she's taking it as pregnant or when she's breastfeeding. Um, and there's a list of drugs that uh, really these babies need to get intramuscular vitamin K. All right? So these drugs that the mother's on, and look, anticonvulsants are quite common. Uh, in, in our community. So th these cross into the baby and they chew up vitamin K uh, and render it um, ineffective. So these babies need, they have a high turnover of vitamin K, uh, they need to have, um, uh, they need to have uh, intramuscular as the recommendation. And look, instrumental deliveries, I haven't got that up there, von Tuss. Uh, subgaleal hemorrhages, do you, do you know what that is? When, when the scalp's ripped off and they start, they can bleed their whole blood volume into their scalp. Look, those babies really do need vitamin K intramuscularly, intra instrumental deliveries, especially von Tuss. Um, Keelans and all those other, th that's a dying art. I don't think anybody does those. I haven't seen a Keelans for years. Thank God. Maybe you'll agree with that. But certainly Wrigley's and um, Neville Barnes are still done. But von Tuss is the sort of the poor man's instrumental delivery now. I mean, I'm sure you've seen those, you know, two, three pools. Please give them intramuscular vitamin K. If you see MRI, every one of those babies, you'll see intracranial blood or subdural blood in almost all of them. Admittedly not a significant amount to cause any problems, but you'd be surprised at the trauma that those cause. Of course, um, uh, um, uh, very few of them have any actual long-term outcomes. Um, look, there's not many mothers on anti-TB drugs, but there is, I mean, that, that's still a factor. But of course, there's lots of... Um, rheumatic heart disease around and people with bits of metal in their hearts and so they're on warfarin and that's in, in especially the Māori or Pacific Island community uh, with us in South Auckland so um, uh, mothers on warfarin um, all right so the 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 that's a good question I, I look I, the, I'd, I'd answer that by saying if there's clinically apparent bleeding, and I, I, I'd, I'm not saying that you know a catastrophic bleed, but other um, minor bleeding abnormalities. Yes, you would consider giving them extra vitamin K, um, but most of them, actually, the intramuscular dose is satisfactory. Okay. All right, hyperglycemia. Um, again, a, a common problem. Um, a problem, hopefully, many of you deal with. In the newborn period? Yes? Yep, good, okay. Right, so the magic number is 2.6. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about why 2.6 is the magic number uh, and maybe terrify you with the, the lack of evidence that that's based.